but uh, they know the difference and they do appreciate a good home cooked meal. Sure. Well, and I think that they foundation, it, but they won't prepare it, but I think that's maybe their age. They won't really prepare it. Like all the ingredients will be here, but they won't prepare themselves like yeah. a great meal. Actually. Well, that's an crazy. interesting. And my uh, kid's dad has a totally different take on food. He's, you know, from the food world and the chef world. So he's like, right now sharing with my son like cured meats and cheeses and <laughs> and all sorts of different things that, that I don't eat you know um so it's good you know they've got a choice and my daughter uh my daughter went and lived with her dad for a few years from 11 till 15 and then moved back in with me and she was real happy to come home and mm. and have my food again too so it works out you do what you do when they're young I used to do like totally Baja mother things like take them camping and you know like it's fish or lentils and nothing else and like ration out the treats and, you know, really get them into the, the natural foods and stuff. Sure. And they do appreciate it. They sense it. They know the difference and they're healthy kids. They're super healthy. My son has never really had any kind of intervention at all for health. Wonderful. He's yeah. really solid and he heals super quick. That's the one thing I notice about the kids that have been raised this way. And even my own body, I'm turning 55 at the end of this month. So, you know, I'm not, quite a spring chicken anymore. Um, last, last weekend I sprained my ankle quite badly and it was fine within about, you know, 12 hours. So I really feel like what happens when your body's on its peak is you heal and recover yeah. really well. Yeah. You can I, see your healing capacity. I think that, that most of, of the population, probably most of the world's population has no idea how they could feel if they were more conscious about the decisions they made of what actually entered into their body, whether it's through the air or, or through their food. Um, mm -hmm. We don't, we, we don't even could, know how much better we could actually feel. Yeah. I think a hiatus, like taking a time out and three months would be my recommended time for anybody over 40 to like pause everything if they can really. Yeah. And not have a schedule. This was recommended by our homeschooling program and it worked great for mom and kids. Um, three months, no schedules. And then you, your circadian rhythms go back. You just sleep when you want to. You play when you want to. You eat what you want to, when you want to. And you have to override schedules and routines and habits. And like you say, the Cheetos are pretty tough. But what happens when you do the <laughs> cleansing process? It's interesting. Because there's really good Cheetos in Canada called Cheesies. You know, they're way better than Cheetos. <laughs> and uh, they're so good. I've been trained to them my whole life. But once you've done the cleansing, like I say, your taste buds adjust and it's like you're new again. And so you taste that stuff. And I have done things like buy Cheetos, say, for example, 10 times. I bought 10 hamburgers. I bought 10 sodas. I've, I've done everything 10 more times than I wanted to. Like I'll take the first bite because it smells so good. And then go, yeah, this is not what I wanted. Like my memory remembers what a great grilled burger smells like and why I thought I liked that but I put it in my mouth and my body goes, Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that happens with Cheetos. It happens with tolerance for sugar, for sweets, for like, I can't even eat American candies and dessert and things like that. Way too sweet. Yeah. Um, your whole body kind of does it adapts. So it's you... hard to do on a day to day routine. It is. Oh you know, yeah. You go, I mean, you're, I, I, you're staying I, home just a couple of weeks to you. Well, I help people reorganize their kitchen and then clear all toxicity out of the house as well. Very important that you're not using bathing products and cleaning products in your home that are yeah. going to be accumulating. You that might be in more industrial settings, you know, that you're not inhaling any of the maybe sprayed things that are in that, in the automobile environment. You know, you just don't want things accumulating. You want a well, well working filter. You are a filter. You're like a coral, you know, we just filter, filter, filter everything through our systems. So we become what our environment is. And as now we know with Fukushima, like most of the seafood is contaminated. We, we are mitigating EMFs and contamination every day. So it's great if you can be um, having a mitigating diet, you know, eating healthy nutri nutritional mushrooms on a regular basis, maybe switching over key things like cheesies, you know, getting into kale chips or, you know, that might not cut it. You, you look for texture and taste. You look for things that replace snacks and, um, that replace just one thing at a time. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it happens real quick. Yeah. And so, it's kind of fun because you save tons of money. Uh, well, that's, that's one thing <laughs> that's, it's amazing too. When you, when you look at how we spend money on food and how, like 
the 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 so wasteful. Well, that comment too. That's that's um and and I this is not me um preaching from a pulpit. I a pulpit. I am a hundred percent of uh I had In and Out Burger last night. <laughs> <laughs> but so to say the uh the I had a um, burger yesterday too i must confess here right? yeah i'm, I'm, yeah, I'm assuming it was just, healthier than just, mine just the burger no <laughs> no bread yeah <laughs> anyways i the the effort required to um to eat healthier I, I don't think there's any that you can't argue that i mean it's way easier to drive through a drive through and get a bag of food and consume it in in 10 minutes and, and move on with your life. And unfortunately that's kind of how our culture, um, it, modern culture is, is, uh, structured, you know, eating in the past. And, and I'm assuming it takes a little more effort for you because you're making things from raw ingredients and you probably perfected it to where it's not as, as inefficient as, as a newbie might be. But there's something about that process of, of, gathering finding buying whatever it takes to to get the raw ingredients and then the prep or or the creation of the meal and then the sitting to actually eat it there's that the the, the lack of that has to be affecting uh human health as well i think yeah. because the times when i, I do always, i always think i mean we know the old saying and maybe not everybody likes this word but uh you know the table the hearth is the altar of the family it, it is the altar yeah of, yeah. our home, of our family. And I think uh, as often as we choose to come there and to share there, it should always be seen with that reverence. And sure. I think if you, in the modern day, for example, if your place of, of enjoying nutrients is the altar of your home, then, then whoever is there when they're there, they're there, you know, like there's sort of a different way of yeah. doing it. Um, I used to put, uh, I used to make food the last few years in Cabo for a stem cell clinic and I'd make the lunches every day for the people that were going in for treatment and I'd put a little prayer in everybody's lunch bag. Everybody, cool. every day. So it's also about, so you're out, you're at your office or whatever. What are you doing to create, you know, an altar for your meal, so right. to speak? You know, you can do it anywhere, anytime and whatever way that works for you. But I think being conscientious of it is huge. I also really do believe again, energy, you know, in informs the physical. So I really do believe in, um, whether you want a kind of a blessing or, or a resonance and acceptance of this food and appreciation for the food, a gratitude prayer, um, or a moment of gratitude before 100%. the meal, I think makes a big difference. Yeah. So yeah. the a couple... time field and nourishment, and I was always told that food prepared with love and, and blessed over made a difference to the end users as well. They always said as they consumed it, they could feel the love in the food. Uh, and that goes back, for, I mean, millennia through oral tradition. Of, I mean, I know Native American Indians. I mean, the, the, the um, gratitude for a kill before they consumed. I mean, all of that. It, it does, it's not some yeah. – it's funny that we have to go full circle and, and – um, we're remembering. We're yeah, not creating anything. Exactly. We just need to remember remember the basics. Right. And we sort of, you know, the last – in our lifetime, for some reason, the world went crazy thinking they could do a whole bunch of things a lot better ways. But old tried-and-true classics seem to be what's really working. Imagine And that. I'm jazzed about some of the more modern, new-coming stuff that – um, you know, like new medicine, like new, new medicine, sure. like great prosthetics and, you know, integrated, you know, new eyes and things like that. But I think the way our flesh body works, I think uh, we knew pretty well how, how to keep it healthy yeah. 50 years ago. Yeah. You know, maybe not from injury. The medicine's been good for injury, but as far as basic care and maintenance, they had it right a right. long time ago. Okay. So you have touched on the fact that, um, Within a few years, you'll be back in in Mexico, uh, or more straddling than you're doing now. Your kids, how old are your kids again? Fifteen and eighteen. My daughter just graduated from high school this okay. week, so I have oh, a son wow. who's got two years of high school. So yeah. here, here's a question for you: they, their their entire childhood was um, uh, jungle kid storybook type of stuff. I'm assuming, knowing you and knowing the general area yeah, that you were totally. Living. Um, My son, in particular, <laughs> barefooted, running through the jungle. They're uh, they're back, or they're in 
more of a modern, fast-paced um, type of lifestyle, I'm sure. How do you think that foundation is going to affect them? You're going back. Do you envision them being back in Mexico at some point, calling that home? Uh, I mean, it's it's obviously home for them, but will it be their long-term home, you think? It's interesting. They're both saying right now that they want to stay in Canada. Really? And they want to continue studying here and continue their education here. They really appreciate the quality of education in the public school system here. Yeah. And they, they feel well-grounded here. They, I think they feel very secure in Cabo, and they know that they can go back at any time. Their father lives there and has a home there, and we have our farm there, so they know that they can go there any time. So right now they're really happy being here. Like this is their adventure. Yeah, they're and exploring. They're really, yeah, they're loving it and they're growing. And I think the foundation that they have has given them a real strong sense of who they are. Yeah. And I think being here in Canada for my daughter, which, you know, mother's daughters always have different dynamics too. She has really gained a lot of appreciation for me and some of the things that I have taught them or um, things that were different you know, that I did different in Mexico than sure. with other people. She has a better understanding of that now. Um, I think we'll always have a house in both places. Yeah, yeah. I, I intend to have a household in both places for the rest of my life. I I can say the same. I, it's, uh, yeah. I, I think about um, the, I mean, we're fortunate to be able to get, to be able to provide those experiences for our children. And, um Kind of makes me sad to think that, the, I mean, there's lots of parents that can't do that for their kids. <clears throat> but as a young person, if you happen to be listening to this, um, just encouragement to you to make sure you get out and explore. And whether that's another country, another state, another city, another block for that matter. being you got to open your horizons up and see new things and meet new people. And, and you can't do that yeah. within the country. Even, even through friends and friends' parents, because we have such a unique environment sometimes where we've got really dynamic um, family members, you know, right. friends. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I would like to say that it doesn't cost money, actually. What, That's a what good point. It's a really good Most point. Most of my adventuring happened because I was flat broke and didn't have a choice. Yeah. No, <laughs> and, I think uh, we feel like... You know, I didn't have a choice. We, we feel like, oh, you People know... People often give well, me accolades for being so adventurous, but normally it's just survival. Survival, right. I, I, I think that so often people hear conversations like this and just assume... I, I did this with, with a buddy of mine um, earlier where he's living in Todos Santos. Uh, it's so easy just to assume. Oh well, yeah, she had a big company. She sold. She sold it, and she's a multimillionaire, and she can live like this. And and you kind of alluded to it already. It's not the truth. Yeah, and yeah. so it's not the uh, these people that you meet in these type of situations are. Yeah, you run into the trust fund person every once in a while, and sometimes those people are just as interesting. Sometimes they're piles of crap. Sometimes but, they're doing good with what they. Yeah, got. yeah. So I think that you hit the nail on the head. It doesn't require. Um, the uh, finances that one may think to go and and have these experiences. In fact, it you know, it almost is better if you have none because then you become resourceful. You have to meet people. You have to have relationship with people. You have to be willing to be helped. Uh, that's that's something that is real hard for people is to to receive support. Yeah, when from you someone start else. when you start traveling on public buses <laughs> and looking for work trades so that you have somewhere to stay and you're like going to somebody's farm to help them with you know some drainage off their kitchen so their banana circle grows or whatever. It's a whole different ballgame of experiences and interactions. Yeah, yeah. We weren't so, human. one of the things that I did want to ask you about, you were in a unique um, profession in Mexico with the, the, the um, destination management company. You had to be uh -huh. an expert on the destination. And I like to think I know a lot about Baja, uh, and I do know a lot of very unique, out-of-the-way places. Um, but you, especially Southern Baja or, or the Los Cabos region for that matter, can you pull out a couple of magical places that are not necessarily on the beaten path that, that a visitor to Southern Baja might be interested in hearing about or knowing where it is? I'm putting and you on the I spot, I know. Well, yeah, that's a whole other part. <laughs> and the one you want to share? share? Yeah. 
Well, we're not we're not hitting the million download mark yet. So even if you do share it, it's probably only going to go to a couple hundred, maybe a thousand people. But yes, one you will share. (laughs) I already alluded to.